So welcome everybody here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the CUNY Siegel Center here. So it's a great a pleasure for us to have hosted the, the workshop, the parliament workshop this afternoon, the second we did. And I welcome Emily, Corey, and uh, Michael to be with us. We um, had a three hour experience of a workshop of what's called the parliament. And we're gonna find out all what it is we have here with us about 20, 30 members of the workshop. I don't know if everybody can see it. Welcome to our viewers on HowlRound and thanks for HowlRound to um, cover this on the national nonprofit um, live stream platform. And we also published uh, this book about parliament because we thought it's such an important um, work. And um, the editor is here with us, Corey, who is also a PhD student in theater here at the Graduate Center. So um, first of all, even so, uh, it was not a traditional piece um, of choreography or of it, but I think still Michael uh, deserves an applause. I don't know, did you ever hear one yet in parliaments? Do you get an applause? Not. So um, before we come to the discussion and talk about this uh, uh, this unusual anim animal of what parliament is, the uh, thing we do not really know, but everybody who tastes it likes it. I had a friend who was a Japanese curator and she says, my gay, my goal is to let people uh, taste the iwami, something that looks a little bit odd, but once you taste it, you know, it tastes really good and you know what it is, but you didn't even know that it was missing from it. And so this is a, one of these pieces, I think that are of real um, significance, the idea behind it, but also the experience. So um, we have with us Emily, Corey, and Michael, as I said, Michael, maybe you first tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you come from, and then we go into the project. First of all, not everybody loves Parliament. Some people really hate it. Is it on? Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't work. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first of all, not everybody loves Parliament, just to make that little correction. Some people really hate it and have a very difficult time, and that's okay too. And they talk about it five years later still about it, which which I appreciate too. So it's a it's a, it's an experience. Uh, I'm Michael Kleen. I'm the I'm a choreographer, an artist. Uh, I'm originally from Vienna, but via various European countries ended up in the South in North Carolina at Duke University, where I'm a professor in dance. And I also run the laboratory for social choreography at the Keenan Institute of Ethics. So I'm, a lot of the work is actually supported or emerges out of uh, thinking and, and creating interventions in the field of ethics, which means you have a much broader conversation with a broader kind of uh, demographics. Since we are close to Broadway, we will have that broader conversation here. Corey, tell us a bit about you. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if this mic is working either. Yeah, um, it's on, but it's the on. Maybe the loudest. Yeah. Is yours working? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hello. Something. <laughs> okay, so we'll share. Um, uh, I'm Corey Tamler. I, as Frank said, I am in the PhD program in theater and performance here at the CUNY Graduate Center, um, where I am writing about co-authorship in performance um and uh and yeah apart from apart from having put together this book um uh I also have a have a creative practice largely working with water um and uh working with a collective in in Maine that um makes work with bodies of water and also uh, doing some similar work in Berlin. Um, and I am also the co-program coordinator for Social Practice CUNY, which is co-sponsoring um, this panel tonight and uh, co-sponsoring the Bringing Parliament here. Um, Social Practice CUNY is a, uh, a an initiative, a cross-CUNY initiative that supports um, graduate students and faculty at the all of the different CUNY campuses, as many of them as possible, who are doing socially engaged, um, socially engaged artworks in various ways. So, and also talk more about that. But just wanted to say that SP CUNY also with with the Seagull is is co-presenting today, and that's awesome. And I work for them. 
and they're cool. <laughs> Uh, my name is Emily Roberto. I'm a CUNY professor. I teach at the City College of New York, which is the Harlem campus of the CUNYverse. <laughs> um, I teach creative writing. I'm a creative writer. I'm not, I'm not a journalist, but I'm kind of a little bit of a journalist, but I have more creative latitude than a journalist. And I write about social and environmental justice issues um, from the lens of motherhood. And I am participating as a fellow in the social practice CUNY uh, cohort this academic year. One of the things I'm really enjoying about it is getting to talk to artists of different disciplines. I'm also married to a writer, it's a little boring because I mean, it's wonderful, but it's so delightful to talk to visual artists who are socially engaged, choreographers who are socially engaged to kind of think about what, what does social engagement look like in art? Um, so this was a, a wonderful experience for me to participate today. I live mostly in my head, not in my body. So when you invited us to think about and well, embody thought, um, that felt very exciting to me and pushing some boundaries for me. So thank you. Maybe we share that one mic. You give it to Michael. Um, what? So, um, and Michael, I don't know if this works at all, but, um, Mike, what is, what is, Parliament, what is social choreography? Oh dear, I, I was hoping that we kind of, I don't have to answer so many questions, but it's and especially the difficult ones like that, uh, because what is social choreography? And I think the book lays it out quite, quite uh, clearly as well. It's it's sort of like a how what do you call it a heavy term, not a or a, a loaded term. Okay, it's the word baggy. A baggy term that means a lot of things to a lot of people, uh, and it's a it's sort of a catch all for for a lot of different practices i think that that came out of a root system of movement and dance and and choreography uh in in the case of the laboratory or how i look at it i i think of uh, social choreography as something where you engage the kind of existing or you're trying to deconstruct the existing social socialization or the, the fabric of socialization at the, and at the same time you're trying to present something else in its place or you're kind of trying to cultivate something some alternatives some alternative realities and they might be very short realities they might be little glimpses that last a couple of hours or they might be prolonged uh environments or initiatives well for all the um how around audiences who weren't here um today at four o'clock and a little bit later because it rained so much about 30 35 people came here to the roof to the came here to the room took their shoes off or not, and then for three hours spent time in here, most of them kind of starting out lying on the floor or sitting, and they were watching each other. Michael gave an introduction talk where he said, you know, be in the room, do not talk, don't be creative, don't have any ideas, and see how you relate. If I understand right, what are the distances? What, what do you experience um, in that time, watching others, knowing that others watch you, and also in some way, in a consent way, you know, there can be a contact in between. Each other. So it was over three hours, which is a very long time. There's a great Harvard professor in art history who says, if you go to a museum, don't run and look at each piece for ten, two or three seconds. Take a notebook, stay for two hours in front of one painting and, in, and experience it. And I often do it. And it really is a completely different experience. So in a way, this reminds me, you quoted Rilke and said at the end of a poem from him, I want you to change your world. Is that, uh, is that your idea? You want to change the world, the person? Or... The, the, the quote is, you must change your life. At, you must at, change your life. At yeah. the end of the, of the poem. And yeah. yeah, sorry, novice. Uh, you must change your life. And... I don't I don't think I mean I'm not naive to think like oh yeah it will change your life as such but what it does it it subtly goes to work to destabilize kind of existing realities a lot of people who leave parliament especially if many do it as a practice like more than once uh, or continuously something is destabilizing outside of the room and you you find yourself moving through the supermarket aisles differently talking to strangers it, it just be start behaving differently and it sort of bleeds out, but like any any good uh, intervention, usually that you know it's being pulled back after a couple of days. You feel it returning to a, an old normal. So 
it has to be a, a practice. But it, what I often say, it, it sort of should offer a psychedelic thunderbolt to take you out of your day-to-day -day world and and present a kind of different way of being in the world. So and and make you feel what it could be and why it's so weird that it's not like that and what happened along the way. In in traditional dance, you know, we see well-trained dancers who have trained for decades in front of us doing beautiful work. We pay a lot of money. We sit in our chairs and we watch them dance and actually, in a way, destroying sometimes their bodies for us. Um, here, it's different. Um, the choreographer gives some instructions. You wrote some beautiful notes over there, a scoreboard, a little Torah roll, which you rolled out, and you leave the room, and then people are among themselves. So um, it's it's radically different. And I, you worked with foresight. You you know you have did also great choreography, but you thought something needs to be different. Something has to change. Corey, my question for you: You are one of our great uh, students, brilliant students. Um, you've seen a lot. You have um, participated a lot. Why is this so important to you? Why did you say I even want to make a book about? It? Um. Yeah, I've been I've been thinking a lot about. I mean, I've only I I've only done Parliament one time before this. Um, it was quite a while ago at this point. It was before the pandemic. It was the first time that we did it at CUNY. Um, I've talked to Michael a lot about it. I've talked also to other um, other people who have participated in it a fair amount about it, and the the book itself has also some contributions, short contributions from people who have participated in, in various parliaments over the years. Um, so, uh, so it was, it was interesting to, to experience it again after like, um, after quite a long time and after, I don't know, the world's changed a lot since whenever we did it, end of 2018. Um, I think recently I kept in the last couple of days, I kept coming back to um, thinking about how uh, I don't even remember if it was you who described it as a medicine at some point, or if that's something that I that's something that I came up with or maybe came up with in conversation with um, with with someone else. Um, but uh but I, I think I was thinking about what made me think of it that way. And it also has to do with this, um, it has to do with this kind of un unbuilding while building that, that social choreography does or aims to do this need to, um, this need to take down and, uh, and build at the same time. Um, I was also just reading a piece of, a piece of Emily's writing, um, where you were kind of also talking about the, the basically experiencing the built environment in Harlem. Um, and, uh, and, and I was thinking about that, you know, knowing we were going to have this conversation in relation to some of the things Michael just said about what, what parliament can do to you the sort of like lasting effect that it can have on you, making you feel kind of thrown out of place in your in your built environment, making you feel how how fucking weird it feels to be like in a place with corners and uh, and walking in a city that's a grid and like how it how it can make you. I mean, it doesn't have this effect on everyone, um, but uh, but last time certainly had this effect on me. How it can sort of make you conscious of of those things and of the constructedness of it, um, and so I think that's that's one of the primary things that's interesting for me. And what I just was thinking about a lot in the last couple of days is like, you know, if that's true, if that's one of the things that it that it does, it's sort of like a, and if it's a medicine um, that that can basically give us sort of a sense of our world ending, what it might be like for our world to end. Um, and, uh, and then it's kind of like an inoculation that um, where, you know, it uh, it gives an inoculation that gives your body a sense 
of what a virus could do to it without you actually having to live through the virus. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, we know a lot of the, for a lot of people, the world has already ended or the world is ending. And it's something that like for us, we maybe get to experience like a safe Same version of yeah. that. Emily, um, for you, um, who is not directly coming out of theater performance um, or dance world, how do you look at this? What do you? What is of interest to you in this project? One of the things that was interesting to me was the length of time. We had the, the gift of time, two and a half hours, almost three hours, to move through different sets of emotions. And um, I was interested, Michael, when you shared at the beginning, the first parliament was held in Greece, is that right? During a time of a social rupture. And so that invited me to think about, well, well what is the rupture we're living in at this moment? Um, there's a, we're in a moment of poly crisis. There's so many things that are tearing the social fabric. And so to be invited into a room uh, full of strangers with very little instruction, <laughs> um, felt a little bit risky and also exciting because we had to put our phones away and we spend a lot of time distracted, at least I do. Um, and so interaction had to look different. And one of the things I enjoyed was how swiftly we turned to playfulness, a kind of childlike state. And there was laughter um, pretty fast. I think maybe five, 10 minutes in, there were a group of people laughing and uh I teach climate writing at City College, and I, I think about environmental writing um, as something all of us can do because we all live in environments, even though sometimes we tend to think of environmental writing as being nature writing. Um, it, can, it can take place in a city, and I do a similar exercise with my students that's about length. Like, uh, I do it around Thanksgiving. I, I, I teach them a Meloche poem, um, Try to Praise the Mutilated World. And then I have them list a hundred things they're grateful for around Thanksgiving, a hundred, not 10 or 15, because that's going to be my mom, my cat, you know, um, but it forces them to be strange. And we were forced to be uh, out of our element because we were given the, the, the gift of a length of time amidst one another. And I moved through, I'm, I'm sure it'd be interesting to hear from others what, what they moved through, but I moved through feelings of, um, delight, uh, discomfort, uh, both kind of physical and mental, at, at some points bo uh, boredom, um, at some points like whimsy or just extreme interest in others. And I don't think we are asked to pay attention at this level often. So that felt like a gift to me. And it's something I think a lot about as a writer as well, just paying attention um, in, in, in the way you pay attention when you're falling in love, right? Or when you're traveling. Maybe we uh, take the mic and have some, uh, we take the mic and have some audience, um, like somebody, what, someone wants to share an experience. Um, is it fine? Maybe post sharing and then we go to questions. Okay. How was it? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> anybody wants to share? I, I can, I can talk. Yeah. Um, I feel like, uh, first of all, like I'm a professional dancer. So coming back to this, really giving back the focus to social function of dance, like how dance all started. It's almost like a ritualistic worm. Like we're all gathered. There's a certain rule, but there's a, no hierarchy. So that's kind of like all God, all spiritual is invited in this. Like whatever you believe is real. So kind of like what we the world we're living in now, like we all have different realities, and that was it. But the best version of it, of course. Um, I want to talk about the awkwardness. I feel the politic of touch, um, the permission you're giving people, why it can be so simple and then non non like linguistic communication, but just simple a message, not even a gesture but you know there's consent to touch. And why cannot, I don't know, like that's the part kind of struck me the most is why we need the four, like what consent means, why that just delivers such message so clear and uh, so strongly, yeah. 
four questions on experience. Yeah. Yeah, for me it was um I, I I have been here in New York City for like seven months or eight months, and I am always feeling like my body is constantly I am always feeling that there's a lot that I am not complaining or that I am being to something that I shouldn't be or to it's colonization, of course, but it's very difficult to untie that kind of understanding inside of your mind. And these kind of experiments let you play with that fears, with the, those, those the, the, the third eye that is watching you. And also with the cynic in your head, the cynic that is saying, hippie motherfuckers, what are you doing? This is so ridiculous. And at the same time, you, you, like, you coexist with that cynic. But then you let yourself be a more childish and play and not take it too serious and not be too transcendent. And then you find having fun time. But the exercise of um, reaching a spontaneity through the other, I think it's very important. Two more, yeah. I, I thought it was wonderful how this consent led to a, an, a tenderness and an intimacy um, that does sort of go back to your essence. But what was also really fascinating and wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had this length of time was that I then observed people who I had really beautiful intimate exchanges, having intimate exchanges with others, and it was all in a spirit of generosity. It was a joy for me to watch, observe someone else express something ineffable, something intangible with someone else when I had also had in my own a very unique experience uh, with that individual. And I saw that happening all, all throughout, the, uh, throughout the time. One more, come on. Um, okay, then, um, before we come to the question part, which is, of course, the, the important one, Michael, a uh, question to you. Where did it start, and why did you do this? <laughs> uh, uh, I sort of mentioned that in the introduction a little bit, that it started... Uh, out of a conversation with a museum in, in Athens in Greece. What year? In 2012, probably, we started discussing it. And I wanted to really, when I went to Greece, I moved to Greece from Ireland, and Greece was really breaking apart at that point. And it was very fascinating. We moved there because we had a house there. My wife's Greek, so uh, we, and I was starting to integrate myself into the troubles in a way to kind of figure out what's going on in this place that I have no clue about that really I don't know much about and it felt like such a binary the way the protests were the, the way everybody was pointing the fingers at everybody of, of guilt nobody took any responsibility for anything it was such an interesting situation and I just thought, what could be a meaningful contribution choreographically, which is sort of a ridiculous thought, because as a choreographer in dance, you don't necessarily think of it a meaningful uh, political statement or something like that. And so we start. I started out with this process and kind of workshopped it over a year. Uh, I also fell from from having a big production base to having no production base. So. I kind of realized, okay, maybe I'm just going to work with whoever I work with, whoever is in the room, and what, what can we do? And we started out in the first time on the on the island of Idra. We did it with eight people, or nine or ten people, I don't know, some, a few people, half of them locals from the island, half of them artists. And it worked out really quite interestingly. And then it moved into the Binaki Museum, where it became like, hundreds and hundreds of people engaged in it and that didn't work out that well i thought there was something wrong with it i, I didn't probably have the right 
vocabulary. And then it's sort of over the last, then I brought it to Durham, to Duke. And in Duke, we really did a lot of parliaments in the last uh, years. And it, it's, it does something, you know, bringing professors together with undergrads, together with the... Uh, together with the community and actually doing across the ages uh, and experience spaces, it, it creates a different kind of quality. It creates a, a, an interesting community that I think was missing before at Duke. So it introduced that. And now I feel like it's on the cusp of actually going more out into the world again. I think there was a period where it was going out into the world. Loads of people were doing parliaments as well as a open source technology, if you want. Then it got sort of retreated back to to a research base. And now I feel like it's opening up again. But yeah, so people, hundreds of them have been done, if I understand right. And often you are not even there. People guided. So um, we always, uh, I think we show interesting work here, interesting artists, but it's important here for us the audience and we have a great audience and it's important to be a good audience also for the artists and to think about how does it change our life our world what you what you want so um we would like to hear from you and now i think we could go to what questions do you have for michael after having been in the room for three hours taking out an entire almost day which is a very tough thing to do in new york city i want to thank you all for doing that and um so here we go who um you first yeah Thank you. Um, so um, when we were practicing it, it reminded me a lot of the ret the meditative retreats that people do that you gather in a room and you can't use technology, you can't talk to each other. Um, I, I was just wondering, how do you distinguish that with, distinguish this with a retreat? And where is the choreography when we, um, when it often comes um as opposed to uh, something that happens as like a, an improv or something like there is usually um something is dictated to the performers where is the choreography in that hmm. uh well two things first of all i i'm not very well schooled in in retreats or meditation I, I have some personal practice, but I don't practice it widely. I see Parliament really as a political project, so I come at it from a different kind of perspective. Uh, and also, in terms of choreography, I think choreography is, a, is such a, it's as well a baggy term, uh, in a way that it's always churning itself, it's always changing. In fact, we didn't have that word 100 years ago. So it, it, in a sense, to choreograph, we didn't have the verb to choreograph. And choreography meant something completely different 100 years ago. We talked about dance making. And so the term is constantly changing. And for the last 20 or 30 years, it has been really under scrutiny, uh, kind of this because of its sort of authoritarian voice upon the body uh, and, and this kind of... Uh, dictating the flesh, how to move, which is a very particular Western phenomena. And there's been a lot of discussion around that in, in academic circles and in artistic practice of how to change that and maybe turn it around, how, how choreography and dance could become partners. Uh, and I define choreography as creating the conditions for things to happen. So actually, I'm much more uh, concerned with creating appropriate conditions in which new systems could emerge. Uh, and that's what the interest is. So I'm not interested in telling people how to move, when to move, where to move. I, that's just past. I used to do that. You can Google it. So, But uh, for the last 20 years, I didn't do that. Thank you, Michael, for being here. Thank you all for organizing this today. Um, just a couple questions. One, I'm curious. Uh, if you've drawn any conclusions, Michael, over the 12 years of doing this about how power is operative in parliament, or if you've observed any trends about how power operates in the room, um, especially in relationship to the title parliament, um, you're not in the room. I'm curious how intentional that is or why that's important. 
Uh, and then Frank mentioned something earlier about instructions to not speak. And I actually don't think you gave us a parameter around speaking or not speaking. You did? Okay. Okay, cool. Just those two questions then. Thank you. Totally. Uh, okay, what was the first question? Just remind me. Oh, the power. Uh, there is definitely, first of all, I don't see parliament. So um, there's a practice part of it where I participate in parliaments regularly. Uh, and I've done so in the beginning very actively. But then I also noticed when I go to places where they don't know me, uh, people start copying what I do or trying, I'm I'm sort of the authority in the room. And that becomes very disturbing to me, but also destructive to the situation because I don't know what I'm doing, right? Uh, so I'm like as lost as everybody else with these strangers. Uh, so I decided to take myself out of the situation, but I get a, I gather a lot of stories. People tell me stories of, of they write me emails. They, I, I So I gather a lot of material of, of their journeys through this. And there is always a, a a real reflection of society within parliament. So it's not like this utopia that is just, it, it also breaks open who's participating, how are they participating, when are they participating. And I often say, well, you don't get the parliament you deserve, you get the parliament you get. And you have to deal with it. And then you have to position yourself. And you can go like, oh, you know, I don't like that, it's whatever. But it's what you get, and you, 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 whatever you decide is actually also a real reflection of your ability to engage or disengage, or see yourself already outside of a certain discourse, uh, and so that that is part of it. I mean, the work in itself might be at times dystopian. You know, it doesn't need to be just great love. You know, like that's wonderful that this is happening, and I experience that strongly as well within parliament but at the same time there is real power structures that that are breaking open but the, sometimes they take over the room as well and it's very fascinating to for me it's fascinating to observe it or to even learn about them and and figure out okay that this is real and maybe if i change a couple of words within the introduction i can actually yield against certain things or enable other kind of things uh, so, yeah, the, these introductions that are only 15 minutes, they're very, very careful, in fact. So it, it sounds like, it looks like I'm relaxed, but I'm actually thinking about it. From the day I wake up on the flight, I'm like trying to get the wording just right. If, you, if you're if you too funny, it becomes very funny, Parliament. It's incredible how mimetic the whole system is. I think we totally underestimate that, on a, genuinely, how how mimetic it really is and how you have impact if you're in a position of authority, how it just translates. So, I, I hope you don't mean me with this. No, no I'm just kidding. No, here you go. So this is true. Thank you. And thank you for that. Um, that just that idea of setting the container and how you start it can really set a chain motion in effect. So it was interesting to hear how you think about the words as soon as you wake up. Um, I actually have a question for Emily, uh, who ex just experienced her first parliament, because you mentioned that you're uh, drawn to this length of time that we had together and, and drew a connection to the assignment that you give to your students to write a hundred things, right? And that length thing. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's any um, other connections or parallels you thought of in a social context of this social experience of people kind of playing off of each other in this parliament situation or noticing each other that you also see in a writing classroom or even in your own writing practice? Yeah, one, one thing we were communicating about, Corey and I over, over the weekend was an interest in co-authorship. I'm becoming increasingly interested. I'm also 20, 25 years into my career as a writer. You mentioned you haven't really told people how to move their bodies in 20 years. I mean, yeah, yeah. That way we typically think of choreography. And I'm increasingly moving away from an interest in single authorship. 
I, you know, sing, it's that was always a fallacy anyway, because you're edited by others. And so to have your, your pure name on something doesn't feel right to me anymore. And I am trying to introduce my students to the practice of thinking about what does it mean to maybe author something, to co-author something. Um, something I tried myself as a writer that I could share with my students. It also has to do with paying attention and observation. Um, was really inspired by this climate scientist named Catherine Hayhoe, who, who says the most important thing we can do to combat climate change is to talk about it. There's a big distance between those of us who are appropriately concerned and frightened and those of us who talk about it with any degree of regularity. And so in response to that, I gathered well, I asked impertinent questions like, how do you feel? How are you experiencing climate change in your body and in your habitat? I asked everybody I knew that question and recorded what they said. And I wrote, I can't say I wrote that. I, I literally put their words, hundreds of people from across, across the globe, right? It's like a chorus or a dirge or something. Um, and I show that to my students. Like, what is, what is this? Like, what does this open up for you? What are the possibilities for working through social problems on the page together? What I liked about today is that it wasn't on the page at all. It was, it was, you know, it was, it was embodied. And it wasn't always easy and beautiful. There were, there were lots of moments of play, but there were some moments of discomfort too, right? <laughs> some moments of touch that maybe weren't negotiated appropriately that needed to be cleansed and moved through and, and all of that. So um, I hope that answers your question in some part. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to do this. It was it was really exciting. Um, I think one of the things that came up for me is the this idea of a reflection. And I do think I realized um, that I was in a room with very creative people or people who had self-selected to come to this type of experience. And so then I was curious to hear more about times that you've done this with people who are not artists or people who would self-select to come to this sort of experience. And if you have witnessed that or what's come up for people in communities that are not artists or mix, like you saying, there's some mixed community and artist settlements. Yeah, so just like hearing about what that's like. Oh, well, Michael? Or... Yeah. Uh, it's, it's different, first of all. I mean, often there's a self-select artistically minded crowd in, especially in closed parliaments when, uh, because of the institutions that are interested in presenting it, uh, when we do it in the, in museums, it, it has a different quality to it because you actually carefully curate who's coming to it. So the actually the three months preparation of curation to convince different communities to partake in parliament is actually the most labor. Uh, so that is definitely very different. Like for for bigger situations, bigger parliaments, uh, I'm okay with dancers coming to it because dancers are citizens too, right? But, but it's more, it's a work for citizens uh, in general. And it's conceived as a kind of technology for citizens. And I'm getting excited when people who never in a room together, when you when you just simply have never been in a room with this kind of demographics of people and start parliament, then that's exciting. Just the room itself, you're hardly ever in a demographics like that anyway, from from the immigrant to the billionaire in the room doing parliament. So we did that for Greece and it it worked not dissimilar, I have to say. You know, maybe a, a slightly different, like, but that's more country to country specific. Like in Greece, there would be a couple of people who sit in, you know, whatever, just outside, open the door and smoke. And you go like, well, we said there is no real brain. And they're like, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> and it's just normal of the cultural kind of, it has a different cultural feel to it. And and in each country that, that I've observe the parliament, there's a clear difference, but there's also a more self-similarity than difference. No. Comment, thoughts? Uh, 
I thank you for coming again. I thought maybe because you have this beautiful book that you've been passing around that um, you could talk about the process of co-writing the book. Um, I've read it and it's a remarkable piece and it really um, gives you process on the page. And so, and I, so, and I'm grateful for that as a person who likes process. And I, I I'm interested in your process. For Corey. Corey and Mike. Corey and Michael. Uh, we didn't really co-write it. Corey wrote it. I'm just saying, you know, I've been involved and we've been closely communicating, but she did the labor. Uh, and I agree, it's a great book. I actually reread it, started re uh, re reading it. Uh, and I just, it's, I read it completely different. That's always a good sign if you suddenly, like, you pick it up a year later and it reflects something completely different back to you. And it's, I, I just love the structure that she's created and I let you talk about it. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Um, it is it is a very multi-vocal book. Um for sure. So I also think it makes sense that you that you use co-writing to describe it. Um, it the the process was that uh, we did Parliament here. Michael and I had a, had um, ha, or I had I had met White, Michael through a through an earlier piece of his, um, and then we brought Parliament here and we did uh, and we did a conversation afterwards. It was it was very similar to to this basically. And the conversation was was a really good one, um, and uh, and and Michael and I also talked a lot about uh, about the piece and other iterations of it. And Michael said, "You know, it's never been written about. I don't even know how you would write about it." Um, and that for me was also kind of uh, an exciting challenge um to sort of think through how you might write about it and and Frank was sort of encouraging us to to turn just the conversation that we had into some kind of publication and we both wanted to go kind of further than that so um so I did uh a, a long interview with Michael over a couple of days and we looked through the the sketches that um that he still had from the very when he was first sort of trying to think through um just trying to trying to design parliament and stumbling towards what it how it could work um and uh and i also reached out to a bunch of people um who had participated in parliament in the past and uh, asked them if they'd be willing to reflect on their um on their experience in it and then and then i had all of this material and um and also did a a lot of journaling myself basically about a lot of a lot of written sort of memory of my own experience going through parliament and um spent a long time wrestling with how to sort of fit all of that together um in in a piece of writing that attempts to kind of lead you through it it, it attempts to be like or a, kind of one of the driving ideas was um to sort of think through what a what a what a book might be that could give you a kind of parliament like experience um i don't know how successful it is in actually doing that but um but that's where the form came from is trying to play with that Show a couple of pages. I also um, yeah. I think that um, it looks so unusual in the representation of idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, it has. Uh, I mean, it's meant to be turned. Uh, this is also Rafael Kozakowski Koz designed this book and sort of took these ideas that I had about um, the book being an object that you have to really like. Uh, you know, work with physically as you read it. And he really um, translated that very well to a design. So that's part of like, as you're going through it, the text goes in different directions. I'm trying, yeah, it's true. I know I'm showing it to myself, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then there are, so um, let's see, there's like, there's, a central a central text central text and then there's a the interview runs along the side so you have to turn the book to read that 
Um, and then there are also uh, the reflections from, um, from participants kind of interrupt the book. They're the blue pages. Um, and, uh, and they're, yeah. That, so they sort of interrupt the flow of writing, which actually makes me think another one of the another one of the images that became important. I mean, part of one of the instructions uh, that Michael gives at the or that belongs to the beginning of Parliament is to sediment, and um, and that's an instruction that um, just asks you to sort of sit with and bring back to to feel free to bring back things that happen to you throughout the course of um, of the parliament and to sort of like let them build on each other. Um, I had a really beautiful experience with that today. I'm like literally looking at the person who I know knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I was like, there's a sedimentation. <laughs> and uh, I almost cried when it happened. Like it was really nice. Um, it, it was just a gesture that we had shared early, very early on in the parliament that came back in a in a way that was a very surprising, like private moment of dramaturgy between us. Um, so sedimentation is sedimenting is uh, is a kind of key instruction for Parliament, and uh, and also just a, a very special has become like a special word for my practice that I'm really grateful to Michael for, because um, I work with water. I know Emily also has a recent project um, working with Tibbetts Brook, Brooker Creek, Tibbetts Brook. Uh, here in New York. Um, and so I was like my own practice with bodies of water was kind of weaving through my thinking as my formal thinking as I was putting together the book and um, and and sedimentation, of course, is also a word that's used that that describes how uh, a body of water, how a flowing body of water sort of builds and unbuilds itself at the same time. Um, and so the uh, a body of water is also one of the images that drives the design of the book and the sort of interruption also of um, that it flows and turns, but that also gets interrupted by different perspectives um, and voices other than mine, kind of like splitting the flow of the book and letting it come back together. Yeah, and to point out, it's a Siegel Center publication. And um, so I think it's the most beautiful book we ever did any more um we have about five eight more minutes a more a comment a question yeah i i think well i've done this before and we've spoken about this but actually i'm curious about other i know that you've been developing like different new choreographies at duke and i'm actually curious is parliament yeah, how is Parliament related to them and the instructions giving? I've never experienced any other ones besides Parliament, but is it something that kind of was a seed for like a whole new area of work? Because you said it's kind of started at this point when you were switching from everything you were doing in Ireland. And is that, yeah, just how? Is it a seed for something or it just started in a chapter and how they're related? Yeah, it, it took me a while after Parliament, I. I, I was sort of in a little bit of a pickle, as in, where do I go from there? Uh, like, where do you build that out? In in what way? And it sort of took me probably another five, six years to come up with a follow up work, which is called Amendment. So, and and it really tried to amend this notion that if we only negotiate between each other, what's happening to ecology in terms of where the animals were, where is all the other sort of, and so it's a score that, or a similar situation, but it's just amending the parliament in a way. Uh, and it's with with electronic noise, so it's a different kind of situation. Is it with electronic noise and light? So, so it, it has a completely different experience. It's it's shorter, it's more compressed. Also, parliament usually is six hours long. I think you people should do six hour parliaments. This is just a taste of parliament. Uh, you have to fall asleep, deep sleep, and wake up in a parliament and continue to really appreciate it, I think. Uh, amendment is shorter, and it, it's almost like works faster. Uh, and then there's a third one which called Constitution, which I premiered last year. And so that's the whole trilogy. And Constitution is like a starting culture of difference, uh, and it works again different. Is it? But it's similar. It's all one trilogy. And now I'm getting more 
comfortable with these situations for citizens and then building them out. Um, got a premier in April called the 11th Organ. And and that's where citizens, I, I haven't got it down yet, so obviously that's, I'm struggling, but citizens together imagining what could be done together, how to move together, like a an augmented reality of a completely imagined dance floor, if you want, in which everything is possible, but actually nobody's really moving. Uh, and so it's one hour with electronic noise, the wildest dance floor of the imagination, so can you really stretch the imagination. And so I'm in the rehearsal process of that uh, with a research group of about 20 people and we're figuring out every week how this could could potentially work or not. So. Oh, I just thought that maybe um, because you uh, brought up um, amendment as a, as as something that pushes more into the ecological possibilities of social choreography. But I also think that in, in general, like I, I think parliament um, has, it, it's, um, I think it's interesting to talk about this work in general for the, the implications for ecological thinking. And I know for you, it's it's always, it's part of your thinking from the beginning. And that um, I'd be interested to also maybe talk about that with Emily, since you write largely, since you are an environmental writer, largely. Um, and I don't know if you have, I don't know if you have thoughts about that, but I guess for me, like one of the very basic things in performance, I think like you, I think um, on the surface, people wouldn't think of this as an ecological work because uh, con the content is not making an ecological statement. Um, but uh, but I think that the the very basic way in which it it makes you as a participant so aware of your networkedness of your or of your embeddedness in the entire situation um uh to to the point where um how sensitive the entire situation is just it it makes you aware of um yeah it makes you aware of your of of your sort of larger embeddedness which is also an important part of ecological thought so even this one though this one in particular is very human. It's very much about throwing yourself onto the other and onto the other person. Um, there is still there are still have deep implications for for like espousing ecological thought. I think it's interesting to talk about that. I don't, I don't know if you. Have any I know questions. we're close to the end of time. Just so I'll just say very briefly, I was thinking about that because increasingly I'm thinking about. You use the word network, but in indigenous practice, we have to think of web of life. And so you, you think you're very aware of being part of a web um, when you're in a room like this with other people. And though it's, um, we're not thinking, we're not being asked to think about the non-human world so much. Um, we were invited very, in a very calculated way, I now understand, to negotiate touch would have to be negotiated. That was so interesting to me because behind that I'm thinking in my own practice, I think, how do we lay most lightly on the land? How do we not, how do we not cause harm? It'd be very, very deliberate about that. Our touch was so tentative at first. You remember? We just reached our fingers out like this, it's like our fingernails and our fingertips. And then we were laughing. Um, but I think there was a lot of deliberate, um, thinking about our connectivity with each other in a way that would that would not harm others, right? Well, I just say, I, yeah, I believe in that there is something like, or my experience points towards the fact that there might be something like mammalian wisdom in us, that, that we know what touch is appropriate, what touch is not appropriate. And it has been sort of torn or or kind of there or confused or but there is actually a simple return to it. I mean, there are thousands of people who've done Parliament, and I never had a real complaint. 
<laughs> you will always have psychopaths. I mean, that's important. There will always, in the metro, in the subway, you can always encounter, I mean, somebody who breaks the social contract. But within such a situation where there's so many people, you know, touching each other without any sort of formal instructions except negotiate it, people can do it. And we uh, have, I lay great trust in, in our mammalian wisdoms that we can actually coexist well if we, if practiced or if allowed to do so. Yeah, so um, thank you. Thank you all for coming. And again, it's a great 21st century work, I think. It's non-traumatic, post-traumatic. Um, it could be done outside with sunlight, even in a big field. You don't need stages. And nobody needs to have expensive lights up um, in theaters as we normally do. And also theaters are big consumers of energy. We forget it, all the companies that fly back and forth. It is a great piece. Uh, it's inspiring. And it really makes us think. And I think this is really uh, what art um, is about, that we see something really completely different um, all of a sudden. And um, and thank you all for being in that space, even though it was just three hours instead of six. But in New York, that's 12 hours maybe. So thank you all. And thanks to our viewers in HowlRound. Thank you. Thank you.